getting treats and coffee, which by all means you should still get treats and coffee. Uh, but we want to make sure that we are able to uh, get through our whole program this morning. So I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I want to welcome all of you to the um, eighth annual Financial Capability Roundtable hosted by the Minnesota Department of Commerce. Um, I'm Jessica Lumen. I'm the commissioner at the department and I'm really excited to be here with you this morning. Um, this is a time, and I'm going to, this is a really cool podium, but it, like, we'll see if I can make this work. I have props. It's confusing. It's hard. Okay. Um, it's a time when we highlight the importance of financial education and empowerment for the state's prosperity and for the well-being of all Minnesotans. Your dedication and service and the organizations that you all represent and also uh, the, being here yourself this morning um, is so important because it helps to make a difference in people's lives. And the information that we hope to share this morning will be tools that we can all take with us uh, as we continue to develop financial capability for ourselves, for our families, and for our communities. With financial capability, we're focused on ensuring Minnesotans have the knowledge, skills, and opportunities to make decisions about money for themselves and their families. The reality is that financial capability is essential for all people of all ages, whether it's young kids learning the basics of saving versus spending, or families managing their monthly household budgets, or retirees protecting their life savings from scams and fraud. At the Minnesota Department of Commerce, senior financial protection in particular has been a major priority for us, particularly over this last year. And that's because Minnesotans are often targeted for scams and financial fraud just because they're older. The statistics are alarming. It's estimated that one out of every five person over the age of 65 has been victimized by a financial swindle, and older Americans are defrauded of nearly $3 billion each year. And unfortunately, as few as one out of every 44 cases of senior financial abuse ever gets reported to the police. And we know that there's a cycle of shame and embarrassment around fin senior financial fraud, particularly because these folks have been incredibly capable throughout their whole lives. I mean, they've earned money in the first place, right? So uh, when they are victims of financial fraud or scams, they're unlikely to report it, um, and particularly unlikely to report it to their own family members. So this is something that we really want to focus on and address. Um, and we can also expect that the, the threat of financial fraud will continue to grow as the senior population grows. Um, we pulled a few numbers, which I find a pretty dramatic, which is from now through 2030, it's projected that every year 60,000 more Minnesotans will turn 65. So for context, that's the same as if the entire population of Lakeville or Burnsville turns 65 on their next birthday. It's a really staggering number. One action that we recently took at Commerce uh, to address uh, senior financial exploitation was the Safe Senior Financial Protection Act, uh, which passed the Minnesota House uh, last week and uh, is awaiting a vote on the Senate floor. Uh, we're really excited to partner with the AARP of Minnesota, Minnesota Elder Justice Center, uh, Financial Planning Association of Minnesota, and others who have helped support this important legislation that will let the department partner with uh, state regulated broker dealers and investment advisors to have new tools around reporting senior financial exploitation and stopping that exploitation before it starts. I also want to mention our hang up on fraud campaign. I hope most of you got um, the folders outside. Look, see, I carry this around with me wherever I go. Uh, hang up on fraud is a campaign that we put together last year um, and have really been implementing this year. And the focus of this is to help seniors and their caregivers with some tools around um, not being victims of financial exploitation. Um, and the, it's a three simple step process. It sounds simple, but you know, in implementation. It's a simple step, right, hang up. If, if, if you're being the victim of a fraud, hang up and not just hang up on you know, the phone, which we hope you do, but also you know, delete the email, um, walk away, say no. Uh, hang up on fraud, um, phone a friend. And this is where that shame and, and uh, that shame spiral happens, is while they might not phone you if they're your parents, um, and why you might not phone your kid if you're the victim of exploitation, there is a peer, there is somebody that you can phone to talk to about senior financial exploitation and, hey, does this seem like a scam to you? Uh-huh, it does. 
Um, and what we have found is that if you can be that friend, if you can use the tools that you learn here and that you learn in the Hang Up on Fraud campaign, um, if you can be that friend, then you can help your peers and your community uh, not be victims of financial exploitation. And then the third step is to report the fraud. Again, if only one in 44 uh, fraud and scam, frauds and scams are actually reported to us, we're never gonna be able to prevent it in the front end and we're certainly never gonna be able to do enough enforcement to stop it on the back end. So if you can report the fraud, even if it's suspected fraud, uh, we really at the Department of Commerce and our uh, law enforcement friends and partners uh, can address senior financial exploitation. Um, we've also been publicizing this toolkit. Jen Fox, who some of you might have met out front, um, and hopefully many of you know, has been going to houses of faith and senior living centers and community centers all around the state to talk about the Hang Up on Fraud campaign. And we would love you to invite her to any of your um, activities or events where you think we might be able to share this message. Because of this work, um, at the Department of Commerce, this year's roundtable conversation is specifically focused on financial capability of the needs of older Minnesotans and their families. Um, so you might ask, why did we invite Nancy Carlson here? Because she's like a children's author. Um, and well, first of all, Nancy is a great speaker, uh, and um, so that helps. Um, but we also uh, really think that she can help us talk about this. Um, the speak directly to the theme of you're never too old or too young to start thinking about financial capability. Nancy doesn't really need much of an introduction, but I get to talk to her about her for a minute. And I got to meet her about a month ago, about actually it was like two weeks ago, right? Um, she is a lifelong Minnesotan uh, and she's grown up in the Twin Cities and she attended the Minnesota College of Art and Design. And she told me and a group of uh, first graders that she decided when she was five years old that she was going to be an author and illustrator. So there's nothing like you know motivation and dedication. Over her career, she has published 67 children's books. 67, I don't know anybody else who's done 67 of anything. Um, and her picture books feature memorable characters, dogs, rabbits, pigs, frogs, and children who undergo typical childhood adventures, learning how to overcome fears, respond positive to life's everyday challenges, and make good choices. Humor, optimism, and colorful illustrations are the hallmarks of her work. Uh, one of my favorite books, look, I brought it, uh, Start Saving Henry, um, is one of the best beginner primers on financial capability there is. Um, and this was a book that she was able to read to these uh, at, at the thanks to the United Educators Credit Union, who's the folks are here in the more in the front. Uh, we were able to go to Golden Valley School, and she read this book among others um, to a group, as I said, of first and third graders who were so enthusiastic as they should have been. Um, and she read from her books, and she taught me how to draw a pig. <laughs> don't don't ask how. Yeah, um, she she was very uh, patient with me, and um, she also answered a wide range of very curious questions, which I think she also hopes you have a wide range of very curious questions for her this morning. Um, and she does that about a hundred times a year. Um, so she's like, yeah, it's kind of the end of the school year. It's probably pretty good. Um, but now it's our turn. It's our turn to hear, hear from Nancy. And today we look forward to hearing from her about her children's book work um, as an author and illustrator. But we also really appreciate that she will share her personal story um, about dealing with very serious health and financial challenges in her family. And it speaks directly to that financial capability um, lesson that we all need to learn, which is that it is something that we all need to think about all the time and continue to work on. So please join me in welcoming Nancy and start thinking of your questions. Just gonna, can I close this and put this right here? Well, yeah, I was kind of curious about why I was <laughs> invited here. <laughs> um, I, but I do have a story to tell. Um, the opposite story of financial capabilities, actually. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my work and um, our journey with um, a disease called FTD. 
And you can find more about the journey on a blog that I started about five years ago um, called Putting One Foot in Front of the Other. And um, that really tells the whole story. I'm shortening it, and there's going to be a lot of questions you probably have because I can't cover everything. But um, I'm honored to be here. It's, it's really great to um, introduce my work and our story uh, to a new crowd. So I'm going to start with uh, one of the early posts, and I'm just going to read it. I usually don't read when I speak, but I really like this one, and I'd like to keep it as it is. I remember a spring day in 2002. My husband Barry was blowing the leaves away that had fallen into the hedges on the large circle of grass in front of our house. I think Barry's loud leaf blower was his most cherished tool. He wasn't very handy at fixing things. And when he did try to fix something, we all waited to hear him say, oh no, and that meant that we had to call someone to complete the task. <laughs> Barry was a champ at blowing leaves. On that Saturday, I was inside painting a leafy trim in our dining room, something I had been trying to do all winter, but the kids' activities and my work got in the way. We planned to host our daughter Kelly's graduation party in a month, and there's nothing like a party to make you get all those projects done. As I sat on a little stool painting, I listened to Kelly and her girlfriends in the kitchen make plans for prom. I wondered if we would host the prom party again. If so, the girls would soon come in and ask me. I didn't mind hosting the party because we both loved having the kids there. Meanwhile, our boys were upstairs in their rooms. Pat was constructing something on a cardboard and tape or drawing or maybe just looking up at, a, at the ceiling where a girl had recently written her name and phone number in permanent marker. <laughs> Irritating. <laughs> uh, Pat was playing his guitar, or, or Mike was playing his guitar, and I remember this because he was teaching himself to play after having broken his leg while ski racing in February. It was a bad break, so he was going to be laid up most of the summer. I got the idea to buy him a guitar to pass the time while his leg healed. I remember thinking that day, he sounded really good. I painted, listened to the girls talking, and enjoyed the guitar music. But just as the girls' conversation turned to the after-school part, after-party plans, Barry and his leaf blower came right up to the hedge at the window, so I couldn't hear a word the girls were saying. Barry waved to me as the girls rushed upstairs to look at her prom dress, stopping first by Mike's room to hear him play Crash by Dave Matthews. At that moment, I thought I was the happiest person in the world. I didn't know then that in just a few years we wouldn't be living in this house I loved so much. We would be broke. The man I loved would become a stranger I couldn't stand. On that spring day, an enemy was about to begin its assault, an enemy we had never heard of. It was an enemy that we couldn't see or touch or even attempt to fight. I'm not sure when it, would, it arrived, but it was silently waiting to take over Barry's brain and begin its destruction. No one on, in this house on that day had ever heard the word, words frontal temporal dementia or FTD. It was lurking there as Barry blew the leaves away. It was there when he popped inside and asked, who wants grilled hamburgers tonight? Everyone, including Kelly's friends, said, we do. I quit painting to run to the store. It was warm, and maybe we could eat dinner outside. I bought ice cream. We were still so happy on that day. However, I do remember feeling that something was off with Barry. I couldn't put my finger on it. But it was on this beautiful spring day, I believe that the evil FTD character began its assault on Barry's brain. This was the day. So um, Barry and I married in um, 1979, long time ago. And um, he started a very successful design and marketing firm in Minneapolis called McCool & Company. His last name was McCool. Um, I began illustrating. <clears throat> My very first job was illustrating this book called Halloween for a company here in Minneapolis called Lerner. They're right down on First Avenue. 
And um, so we were just, everything was going well. I uh, illustrated two books for Lerner, and it was at that time the, the editor at Lerner said, you know, you should try and uh, write your own stories. So I looked under my drawing table, and there sleeping like she always did was my dog, Dame. I began to sketch her. I imagined her in a dance recital and uh, handed this uh, book into my editor, and she said, let's go with it. Um, I did learn something important the day I handed this book in, is that um, the book was actually 89 pages long. I had every emotion with a recital. Well, I learned that picture books are 32 pages, not 89. So we cut the book apart, and the book was created, on, actually on the floor of her office. And um, luckily, this book was reviewed in Newsweek. Why? I have no idea. I've never had a book in Newsweek since. But um, the editor said, well, the owner of the company, Harry Lerner, said, quick, have her write more books. So I did. The first year, I wrote five books on Harriet, five on this little, um, this little rabbit called Loudmouth George, and then five on Luann the Pig. There's three here, but there's five in the series. So at the end of three years, I had a whole shelf full of books that I had written. I had, um, you know, uh, like real estate in the bookstore. Rather than one book, one book doesn't sell, but a group sells. So I was well on my way. And Barry's business was growing, and uh, our family was growing. As a matter of fact, by the time I moved to a new publisher, Viking Penguin in New York, um, I was pregnant with our third child, Mike, and I started this series of books on Arnie the Cat, and oddly, Mike came out looking like Arnie <laughs> the Cat. <laughs> Sorry, Mike. <laughs> um, being in publishing at, in the 80s was fabulous because um, Barnes & Nobles was spreading all over the country, borders, um, big chains. Lots of independent bookstores were growing, and um, because of that, they needed books. And so Viking was a great place for me because they, they accepted every idea I had. One day I called and I said, I have an idea about a book liking yourself. She said, sure, here's a contract. And I'm really glad because this is one of my favorites. It's I Like Me. And on the first page it says, I have a best friend, and this friend, best friend is me. Here's my favorite page. When I get up in the morning, I say, hi, good looking. <laughs> it's very good to say each day. Um, at the time that Look Out Kindergarten, Here I Come came out, my husband decided to sell his business and um, work with me. He began to be um, my agent, my everything. He did all of my selling of my books. He lined up all my school visits, my travel. He did everything. And he did an awesome job at it. He was so good. Um, he renegotiated bad contracts I had with Lerner where I didn't own my first characters. I guess um, something I learned early in my career, hire a lawyer to look at your contracts. I didn't. So I didn't own Harriet and George. But Barry, when he quit his, when he sold his company, there he was, and he negotiated back all my characters, my rights, and got me royalties, and some new books that I did with Lerner. At the, this was our biggest year. <laughs> he um, helped me get this job through Target. Um, I did the Snowden. I did everything for Snowden that year. Got really addicted to Target food because I traveled all over the country, <laughs> signing Snowden books. And it was great. I mean, we were just doing wonderful. But you know what? I never asked him a question about what was going on. If he came in, he said, sign this contract, I signed it. If he said, here's a piece of paper about whatever, sure, I'll sign it. I trusted him 100%. And I remember going out with people and saying, well, who better than having my husband work for me? I don't have to worry about anything. That wasn't smart on my part. Now, I've been drawing um, basically my entire life, as my introduction said. And um, when I'm not doing books, I just draw. This one was an older one. And, I, and when I draw, I express how I'm feeling. This is obviously when I had small children at home. 
says, oh my gosh, the toddlers are attacking. Very scary. Obvi apparently when I was still dating, um, she waited patiently for her date to arrive. It had been two weeks. <laughs> so um, I continued to draw, and every night when the kids were in bed, I would just draw and doodle away. And my husband said to me one day, you should post what you're doodling every night on the internet. I didn't even know how to scan. I, I really didn't even understand that I had a website back then, but I did. So I, st I learned scanning. I started posting my, my doodles every day on my website, and that was over nine years ago. I'm still at it. Um, this one, this, car this says, carrots think they are so cool. So at this time, when I was, you know, figuring out this doodle thing, we were trying to sell our home. We were living in this giant home. Our last son was about to head off to college, and um, we were really desperate to sell it. Very more than me, and now I realize it was because we were falling into this huge financial hole. No idea what was going on. Um, I was irritated while we were trying to sell our home. This is one of the doodles I posted. I can't take it anymore. Uh, Barry was beginning to change and making really bad choices. And uh, one of the things that happened during the time we were going to sell our home, Barry came running into my studio and he said, I have a big idea. Um, there's a show on TV called Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? And he was really, he loved that show. And he said, I'm going to try out. Tryouts are coming to Mystic Lake. He goes, I'm going to be on it for sure. Because who has a cooler name than me? McCool. And they're going to pick me, and I'm going to win a million dollars. And I remember sitting there thinking, what? This isn't him. This isn't the way he would react to things like this. Um, he was sure he was going to win that, that show. Now, Barry never wanted any, any attention on himself. He never wanted anybody to, you know, ask him questions. He was a pretty quiet guy. As a matter of fact, when we went to book events, he would introduce himself as Mr. Nancy Carlson, not Barry McCool. So to, for him to think he was going to win the Millionaire Show, I remember thinking, this is so strange. But I kind of went in, you know, I kind of got excited about it too. Well, he got up. 2 a.m., dressed in all these layers because it was winter, stood in line out at Mystic Lake, and he didn't even make the first cut. And he came home, and that was the first heartbreak, I think, on this FTD journey. He really thought he would make it. So um, here are some early signs that Barry was um, exhibiting uh, when we were still in the big house. First of all, he would um, eat multiple breakfasts. Like he'd eat breakfast at 9, 10, 11. I'd be, Barry, how many breakfasts are you going to eat? And he was obsessed with blueberries. Blueberries everywhere. So multiple breakfasts, he fell asleep everywhere. So like if we were out with friends at a restaurant, I'd look over and he's dozing and I'd be like, oh, wake up. Um, he wore the same thing every day, which isn't that odd for people who work at home like we did. We just, you know, we didn't have to dress up or anything, so we just kind of threw on the same thing. But he took it to the extreme. He always wore this shirt that said Berkeley College of Music all the time. And then um, he had rehearsed conversations, which is um, really something hard to pinpoint until you go out a lot with people and you realize that your husband is saying the exact same thing to the rehearsed, everything in the same order, and they never ask anybody else how they're doing. So I'd yell at him and say, you didn't ask so-and-so how their kids were. But again, these weren't, you know, enough to make me really get too worried. And I blame the recession and also blame the fact we couldn't sell our home. I mean, it was a tough time. Still, I doodled away. I tried to help myself. So I did doodles that reinforced me, ho hopefully feeling better. This one says, don't worry. All will be fine. Think positive. Hey, you're not a guinea pig. That's positive. Um, everything will be OK. You have your health. So finally, 
we sold our home. And this was exciting. And I'm going to read this part from the blog. We finally sold our home, our big home, after three years. We paid off two mortgages and had little money left. Our savings were gone, and I knew we had to start over. One day, after we moved into a much too expensive rented carriage house, I told Barry that I had faith that we would make it. I told him that I would work hard, he could get a job, and we would get out of debt, and we could get tattoos that said, we did it. <sighs> um, he just stared at me, confused. Then he said, thank you. And then he went back to feeding the dog, which became a huge obsession for him at that time. It took me, I mean, it shook me up that he didn't seem to care. A small part of me was beginning to realize that I may be doing this all on my own. But still, we, you know, kept at it. Um, I actually, at this time, when we moved to the carriage house, I, I actually said, you can't represent me anymore because he was making some mistakes. And I was mad at him virtually every minute of the day. Um, unbeknownst to me, he was borrowing money from our friends, and he told them, by the way, never do this, um, he told them not to tell me. If one of the couples had told me, uh, I probably could have caught it a lot sooner, but nobody told me. He didn't pay our taxes, bills, and our rent. And um, so again, I was angry every minute of the day. And rather than going to a professional to talk about Barry, I just talked to my friends. And here's what they told me. This was also a bad move on my part. When I said, I, I can't stand that man, be nice to Barry. It's a tough time. No one can find work. One friend said, quit nagging him. Another friend said, he loves you so much, don't be so mean. Another said, it's ageism, not Barry. My mom said, he's acting this way because he's so scared of you. I was scared of me too. I hated the person I was becoming, a big crab. So things were going downhill and I had this big idea bad idea to become caretakers. And I thought, this is going to be it. This is going to solve all our problems. Um, Barry can be the caretaker. I can continue to work. We get much reduced rent. It's just going to be fabulous. Of course, I didn't really listen when, well, we got hired, and I didn't really comprehend what the job was. Shoveling 75 sidewalks by 6 AM when it snowed, do, helping with lockouts, cleaning the office, cleaning people's apartments when they moved out. The lady who hired us said, no one ever moves out. Why? <laughs> People moved out all the time. And um, I was beginning to realize, again, Barry was no help at all. As a matter of fact, our very first night, it became obvious that this was a big mistake. Barry could not seem to grasp how to clean. Naturally, I thought, because he slept through our training, which he did. Um, our first lockout, a toddler shut the door and locked himself in the townhome, and his parents were frantic. Barry couldn't figure out the master keys. Finally, the father took a screen off and climbed in the window. We were no help at all. So I called my lawyer, a friend of mine who's a lawyer. I didn't really have a lawyer at the time, but She's a friend of mine, and I was um, desperate for advice. And this is also a post which I'd like to read. I was just starting to discover the real debt we had. I learned some interesting things from my friend that day. First, she said Barry's symptoms sound a lot like those of her father, who had dementia. She urged me to have him checked out in a neurological clinic. She told me to gather all the paperwork and unpaid bills I could find to get a handle on just what we owed. I told her about the people Barry borrowed money from. She asked about our bank and whether I had, had deposited any money recently. I said, yes, I just put a royalty check in today. She said, go this minute, take that money out of your account now. I jumped in the car and drove to the bank. My heart raced 
as I tried to take out the money, but I was too late. It was all gone, every penny. Our account had been closed and all the funds taken to pay back the bank. I sat in my car and cried. Then I called Barry and yelled at him. He had no reaction at all. And now, this moment, I knew I was alone to figure this out. Still in the car, I wondered how I would pay the bills. How would I pay for testing for Barry? I called the clinic, but I couldn't get in until the fall. Um, and something clicked in me. I survival mode. I googled check cashing places. I'd never known anything about them. I saw the ads on TV, you know, payday loans, but I, I didn't know anything. And I actually went there and figured out, um, along with everybody else that was living on the edge, it's a way to survive without a bank. I couldn't get a bank at this time. And so um, you could pay all your bills, you could pay your um, phone bill, everything there for huge, huge fees. And when I cashed a royalty check, they were just happy as can be because they took this gigantic fee. But I didn't care because this is survival mode. And I took the money, this is a box I got at um, Alan Page's foundation, he wears that bow tie, and there was a bow tie in there. I took the bow tie, lifted it up, and every time I cashed a check, I put it in this box and hid it so Barry couldn't find it. And it was um, a very time-consuming um, period for me because waiting in that line was hours sometimes to cash a check or pay, pay a heating bill. So finally we got in, and Barry was diagnosed right away with FTD. I was so relieved, and I was so glad not to be angry anymore. Boy, to, to be tense with anger for years, and then to hear that he actually had something, it was really a wonderful moment for me to not be mad anymore. So what is FTD? Some of you probably know, but I'll just tell you a quick um, some of the symptoms. Um, FTD affects the executive decision-making part of the brain. The frontal lobe is responsible for problem-solving, personality, and common sense. The temporal lobe covers memory, language, comprehension, and hearing. It is common for people with FTD to have extreme changes in behavior and personality, including loss of empathy and interpersonal skills. Some have inappropriate actions. I have horror stories from my support group, mood swings, and some obsessions. In short, it robs the person of both personality and ability. And um, it usually starts in the early 50s, maybe, you know, somewhere, maybe 55. If you're 65, which I am going to be next, next year, you're pretty safe that that won't be something you'll get because it does strike early. So here we... Go. Um, common sense. I took the, uh, I got a pumpkin that fall, actually it was a whole year after his diagnosis, and I said, don't carve it, don't touch it, I'll be back. Um, I live, live with Barry and started caretaking. I stopped being a, a caretaker and became a caregiver. And I said, don't touch the pumpkin, but when I came home, he had tried. He didn't take the top off and dig it out, and he was so proud that this is what he had done. Um, this, you have to learn to laugh at FTD. I found his bike in the garage, and um, he, instead of a water bottle, put a margarita glass in there. <laughs> you know, okay. <laughs> um, so some of these um, characteristics really made sense with Barry. Um, one day, again, interpersonal skills go out the window. One day, we were walking out, out in our complex, and. He looked at me and said, boy, are you getting fat. And I said, well, thanks a lot. <laughs> and, you know, I, you can't get mad at a guy with FTD. And then a few minutes later, we were chatting. I said, well, what are you going to get me for my birthday? And he said, a book on dieting. <laughs> <laughs> so here are some of the things that finally made sense with what he was, how he was acting for so many years before I caught it. Hyperoral. And that's when people compulsively eat. He was eating, as I said, multiple breakfasts. Um, he was gaining a ton of weight. 
and blueberries, as I said in the beginning, were everywhere, piled in the, in the um, uh, fridge. Neurological symptoms are similar to Parkinson's, so they become quite rigid and they lose any facial expressions. So um, I have pictures of our daughter's wedding and he couldn't really smile at it. And I remember thinking, Barry, you didn't smile at the wedding. And um, it's because those things were leaving him. Our first snowfall before he was diagnosed and we were caretakers, we had a shovel. And we got out, we we're shoveling, and it was four in the morning. And he came limping over to me, he said, I just fell and I can't shovel. And I said, you have to shovel. And he goes, well, I hurt my back. I said, no, you didn't. You have to shovel. <laughs> and I realize now looking back on that, that he fall, people with FTD fall all the time. They become really rigid and they become, um, they shuffle you know, very, very much like a Parkinson's. Um, so I felt bad about that in retrospect, but I yelled at him. Personal hygiene goes and that, that explains why he always wore the same thing. Um, lack of insight, the fact that he told me I was fat. <laughs> and um, also, when we were caretaking, he had no idea he wasn't helping me. He didn't think it was odd to borrow money from people. Um, he didn't um, feel that he was doing anything wrong when nobody told me about it, that he asked them not to tell me. And then emotional blunting, so he wasn't moved at our daughter's wedding. Our first granddaughter was born, he didn't show any emotion. And when I thought I was gonna divorce him before he was diagnosed, um, he didn't seem sad or concerned in the least. So these behaviors all started to make sense. And what was I supposed to do about it? I didn't know. Um, one day, I went out hiking at Fort Snelling and I was just so stressed. He was diagnosed, we, I was taking care of him. He was still able to be alone. And I thought, now how am I gonna cope? And I looked down at my feet and I was putting one foot in front of the other and I thought, well that's what I'm doing. I'm going to just put one foot in front of the other every day and I'm gonna write about it because I have no way to process this information unless I write and draw about our journey. So that's when I started the blog called Putting One Foot in Front of the Other. So um, I sat down and started writing and I started to tackle our huge, huge financial problems. But you have to have humor in this disease. Um, for my 60th birthday, we all went up to Lutzen and um, we were gonna hike and everything and Barry couldn't really hike by then. He was just still shuffling. So um, we left him back at the, the condo and we went off hiking. And a couple hour la hours later I came back and my phone clicked in because it was finally in range. I had a whole bunch of calls from him that said, I'm going to the lodge to take a shower. And then I had a whole bunch of calls from the lodge. <laughs> and uh, this was not good. So the person at the front desk just left a message, come to the lodge right away. And we were just nervous wrecks. I ran to the lodge and sure enough, he had looked for a shower, but he decided to jump in the hot tub that's you know surrounded with kids playing in the pool, naked. And um, he was pulled out and we weren't kicked out. I explained what he had. And they were actually really nice about it. And you know what? We all laughed our heads off about it. We called it the incident from that <laughs> moment on. <laughs> the next hike we took the, the second day, he had to come with us, obviously. <laughs> um, so tackling the paperwork and everything that was laying ahead of me, um, I, first of all, did something that um, everybody should know about and that's going to the Alzheimer's Foundation. He didn't have Alzheimer's, but the steps that they give you for someone suffering from FTD or Alzheimer's is fantastic. And I had never talked to anybody about this other than my friends and everything and family. And you pay some money, but you get to talk to a social worker. I mean, to vent to her was the most amazing thing. 
but she gave me a list of things to do. And first on that list was a driving assessment. And um, boy, am I glad I did that because Barry was driving probably longer than he should have. And I, she said to me, you need to take him to the Courage Center because that way the Courage Center takes the license away, not you. So I took him to the Courage Center, and sure enough, he failed immediately. The, the poor tester was like <laughs> really shaken up. And um, <laughs> so he lost his license. It is the hardest thing in the whole journey. Um, it's the only emotional thing he's ever felt about the journey of FTD. He wanted that license. But the good news is it wasn't me that took it away. It was the lady at the Courage Center. And for weeks after, he said to me, I want that lady's number. I'm going to call her and tell her she made a big mistake. <laughs> so thank goodness for the Alzheimer's Foundation. They also taught me about getting disability for him, the caddy waiver, medical assistance, um, all these things that I never, ever knew about. And I thought to myself, I had been whining, no more whining, just let's get this going, let's get this figured out. Meanwhile, I was drawing Barry as I'm trying to figure all these things out, trying to make sense of what was happening to him. Um, so I, well, first of all, I started to try and, like I say, figure this stuff out. But here's what I have learned about this journey. First of all, and as I was going through it, there are a ton of nice people out there. I cannot believe how kind people were. I met some stinkers in there somewhere, but <laughs> mostly people were nice. One time I went to the bank to pay off some of the debt we owed, and I brought a cashier's check. She goes, we don't take cashier's checks. And I said, well, I had just been to the cash place. I ran back to the cash place, ca cashed the cashier's check, brought the cash to her, and I just burst out in tears. I was just so frustrated. She grabbed my hand and said, you're going to make it. You're going to get through this. How nice. You know, I mean, I was just like, I can't take it. And to get this, meet so many wonderful, even the ca cash check places, were the, the place I went, they were pretty nice to us. Um, my biggest mistake not to be involved in our personal finances and our business. If I could just take back the times I said, you go to the accountant, I'm fine, I'm gonna draw. I should have gone. I would have learned that he wasn't paying taxes, but I didn't, didn't go. Um, I also learned to uh, carry a power of attorney. My lucky, lo my wonderful lawyer, when Barry was um, first diagnosed, said sign this go get it notarized while he can still write. And I did, and I carried it with me everywhere, and it saved me a ton of time. Don't give up. That's what I also learned, that you cannot give up in this journey because, um, and everybody, everybody here, you, me, you're much stronger than you ever imagined. I, know, I thought I was just a big wimp, and um, boy, I had strength that I didn't know I had. So I went and got um, the medical assistant <coughs> paperwork. I filled it out three times and got rejected. And finally, I went down to the headquarters here in Minneapolis, downtown Minneapolis, and I brought the paperwork, handed it to the lady <coughs> behind the desk, and she said, well, honey, you're, handing, you're filling out the wrong form. And I thought, well, could someone have told me that <laughs> three forms ago? And then she said to me, you know, these forms are written for an eighth grade education. You should understand these. Um, she was one, not one of the nice ones. <laughs> but I did fill out the right form, finally. And sure enough, we got a nurse out to interview Barry. And Barry was in great behavior that day because she asked him, what would you do if there's a fire in this place? And he goes, he said, I'll call my mom. His mom was dead. And then she said, do you feel aggression towards anyone in this room? And he said, yes, and he pointed at me. She checked, checked, checked. We got the medical assistance. We got disability. We got the caddy waiver. 
and that meant that I could put Barry in a daycare. I had learned about daycare through the Alzheimer's Foundation, and daycare was wonderful. He got to draw, he got to listen to music, he met new friends, gals flirted with him, it was great. <laughs> he had a good time. Um, and, and I got Metro Mobility, which was so wonderful to have someone pick him up, drive him to daycare, and then I could continue working to get us out of debt. It was really great until Barry became quite aggressive. Um, he started to lose speech, so instead of you know normal conversation, he just said F you to me all day long. And he became incontinent, and I couldn't take care of him anymore. So because I had all this in place, thank goodness, I was able to get him, first of all, an assisted living. And what I learned about this journey with assisted living is assisted is not assisted. Mm -hmm. um, he was kicked out in two months. He was not, um, he, FTD is not the disease they want in assisted living because FTDers are on the move. They're constantly going. They do inappropriate things. I got a call. Barry's walking around at 6 a.m. He's drinking a beer. Um, and they didn't like that. <laughs> I wonder why. Um, so he got kicked out. And um, then he did this thing that a lot of people with Alzheimer's do. They start doing this hospital trip deal. They go to hospitals here, hospitals there, to figure out their medications. And Barry did the hospital deal about three times when they called the last time. It was out, I think, at North Memorial. They said to me, okay, his medication's okay, you can take him. And I learned through senior linkage line that I can say, no, I can't take him. I can't, I can't take care of him. And then they, are, they have to place him. So he was placed in a care center. And um, if I just couldn't believe I was putting my husband in a care center, which um, has an interesting kind of life going. Um, I hated it at first, but I do want to read the post I wrote about the care center because um, it's one of my favorites. It used to be when I visited the care center, I couldn't wait to leave. And when I wasn't there, I couldn't wait to get there to see if he was okay. I'm pretty sure most people in this, in this situation feel the same way. At first, I hated the smell in the place. I kept my head down and raced to his room. Early on, I was so thankful he had a place to live, I didn't speak up and ask questions. I would get to his room, sit, and sometimes gagging from the smell. I hated going there, and I found myself becoming bitter and crabby. I realized that if I didn't change my attitude, I would be no help to Barry or myself. But after a year, his care center was no longer the dreaded place I had to visit each day. I wish to God he wasn't there, but here are a few things I learned. Barry is my husband, granted a stranger from the old Barry, but I still loved him, and he deserved to be cared for. Everyone deserves that. Once I accepted that, it became easier to visit. I learned to get used to the smell. The staff work hard to keep the place clean, but it is what it is. People wear diapers, and they sometimes smell. After Barry got changed, I asked the nurse to spray his room. They had cool stuff that really masked the odors. I also had to remind myself that I'm a grown-up, not a wimp or a kid with a weak stomach. I learned to speak up. If Barry seemed wet or uncomfortable, I asked for help. If he seemed agitated, I told the nurse to give him something. The staff at the care center never resisted helping him at any time and it got easier for me to ask once I got to know everybody. I learned that the care center is a very interesting place if you take the time to notice. When I started to look around and got to know people, it became more fun to visit. I'd stop and greet a lady every day, even though our conversation was always the same. I would say, hello, and she would say, you're here every day. I said, yes, I am. She said, who do you see? I said, my husband, and then she always said, oh, you seem so young. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> I greeted the lady who wore Barry's shirts. This is a doodle I did about the shirt problem. Um, each time I got to Barry's floor, I said the same thing to the TV crowd. The gang's all here. Sometimes I got a few smiles. 
Then one guy would report on Barry, on what Barry had been up to when I was not there, which was a good thing to know. I saw a few romances bloom and noticed that when rooms were empty, I, I was amazed, too, that a hundred-year-old year old woman always knew my name. I learned that mealtime can be interesting. I could never bear to eat the food, but it was fun to visit with the aides who fed the residents. Conversations with Barry could be odd, especially when he repeated everything he heard around him, including song lyrics that he, that he would pick up from the CD playing. Once I noticed when I fed Barry, I didn't feed him what I d personally didn't like, like Brussels sprouts. I didn't expect to be doing this at my age, but it's what I had on my plate. So I tried really hard to figure out a way to find some joy in each day. I have to admit that I kind of like the person I have become with all I have learned, but it's sad because I can't share it with the person who helped me learn it. So Barry was in the nursing home actually about three years. And um, first he wandered around. And then um, there were many times when I wanted to give up on all this paperwork. I thought, gee, maybe I could just tiptoe over to Canada. No one would know. But one night I, wrote, I just did this doodle. It said, dear Nancy, do not give up. Had that up for a long time. And um, November 2016, he died of FTD. It's usually eight to five year um, they live with it. And um, so it's, I'm still trying to get out of debt. <laughs> I'm working on it. And um, I just want to read one of my last passages from my blog. It's April 2017. Another Minnesota winter has come and gone. The weather was pretty good, not too cold. March came in like a lamb and went out like a lamb. Getting into the spring state of mind was a bit hard this year. I was up at the North Shore and looking at the wonderful sunshine bouncing off Lake Superior. But I didn't quite feel the happiness that I did when spring begins to burst around. I think it was because I was stuck rewinding Barry's last years in my mind. As I backed up my phone the other day, I was startled to see pictures of him looking so sick. I kept having thoughts about what I should have done differently. Why did I go home on the final night and sleep in my own bed while he lay at the care center alone? Why didn't I try to keep him at home longer and try to take, heart, take care of him? Should I have paid for physical therapy for him um, to help him with his limbs? I knew it was useless to think about these things over and over, but I couldn't help it. Most of all, I thought how unfair it was that Barry couldn't see this beautiful spring day. I know it was normal thinking for a person who's just five months into the loss of a spouse. When people asked me how I was doing, I always told them, fine, fine because I lost Barry a long time ago. If that was true, why well, didn't it get any easier? I was also worried about my future. Will I sell a book I'm working on about Barry? I've been working on it for three years. Should I just write a picture book instead? Or should I get in my car and keep driving until I find a new life? I couldn't do the latter because I would miss my family too much. I kept reminding myself that planning a new future was not the right thing to do this first year after losing someone, but I had always been impatient by nature. I just wanted to know what I'd be doing in the next year or two. On this beautiful spring day, I decided to take a page from my own playbook. I stopped working on my book for the afternoon, tied up my boots, got out, and did just what helped me from the very beginning of this journey. I went for a hike. I have continued putting one foot in front of the other. Instead of second guessing myself and wishing I could escape this loneliness and uncertainty, certainty, today I went outside to look for signs of spring because in that there is always hope. So um, now I actually have a bank. The IRS seems really content. Um, <laughs> please. <laughs> Um, that, has anybody ever said that sentence before? <laughs> I don't think so. Um, 
because they take money out of his Social Security each month for the back taxes. So um, I'm happy with that. They seem happy with that. Um, I forgot to mention that also part of the paperwork um, mountain that I tackled was I did file Barry for bankruptcy early in his disease when he can, he could sign the paperwork. And that has helped a lot. Um, his student loans that he took out, um, and we don't know really what he used them for, some of them were forgiven because of his illness. Um, so um, I'm tackling it a little bit. I'm still hiking every, almost most of the summer I go up hiking. And I even saved enough money to buy into a little trailer in Grand Bray so I can see Lake Superior from my little lawn chair. Um, you know, it's not the, the life I imagined for myself at age 64, but um, you know what? It's, it, I think it's going to be okay. And um, I, as a, I said in the post about the nursing home, pretty proud of the person I have become because of this illness. So I wanted to leave a few minutes at the end if anybody had questions about um, FTD or our journey. I'm not a big expert on FTD. Um, they did do a big financial study uh, this last year, and some of it is out on one of the tables out there, on the um, first tables you come in, about the devastation, the financial devastation that happens with this illness. My story is just one of many with FTD. I'm not uncommon with what happened with our finances at all. So uh, you may want to go to the um, FTD website and check out this study that they've done on this financial impact. Anybody? Questions? Uh, my question is not about FTD, uh, but I did learn a lot, thank you, and I'll have to look more into that. As a young person, it's not too uh, part of my worldview. So, uh, but my question is about your your th like kind of therapy with the with the doodling and and did you see periods of your life where it kind of fluctuated and and how were you able to get back into that as a as a way to cope with the extreme emotions you were going through and yeah so just like speaking to how it like changed throughout your life and and what I can learn from that well I think um, well for me drawing is I just can't go I can't not draw so. For me, I never stopped. Um, I've, the, the doodles went from really sad <laughs> to very uplifting. And now if you see them, I'm still posting them online. I'm actually going to quit when I'm 65, which is next October. I'm not going to doodle every, I'm going to draw every day, but I'm not going to post them. But you'll see there's a joy in them. And seeing that transition of you know, these just depressing to happiness, I like looking at them because I think, yes, I'm going to make it. Um, but I do suggest to groups that I talk to that um, even if you're not an artist, to find a creative outlet for yourself if you're going through something like this. It doesn't have to be FTD. It could be cancer. It could be anything, any sh divorce, something shocking that you didn't expect in your life. Uh, a creative outlet is sure a great way to express yourself. And who cares if anybody ever sees it? You're doing it. You're expressing yourself. A lot of my FTD group that I, um, or support group, they all write about it. Um, not many are artists, but they, they write and they have journals, and it really helps. So um, I think, it, again, if you're going through something like this, to find a way to get it out and express yourself is really, really good. Right here. here. Way up. Oh. Well, you could probably just shout it to me. <laughs> yeah. um, where can we find copies or get additional copies of Start Saving Henry? That's such a great book. Yeah. Hmm. Through me. <laughs> no, it's, it's available through the Scholastic Book Clubs. And um, I do have some out there to sell if anybody's interested. But if you can't, oops, what did I do? That was dramatic. There we go. That is touchy. 
Um, if, if you call, maybe log into Scholastic Book Clubs and see if you can order some. Yeah, I think you have to get a PO number and go through all that, but you could give it a try. I could send you the link if you want. Yes, I do. Thank you very much. <laughs> Start saving Henry. <laughs> it all helps. <laughs> Anybody else? I think I saw a hand back there. Um, I just want to appreciate your honesty. I thought it was great what you presented today. Um, one thing I love that you shared is like getting a handle on your finances. What did you have to do after this just to get even a clue of what was going on? Well, you mean about... Whether it be how much debt you had or all the taxes, like how did you even unfold all of that information? One footprint, one step, I mean, I, one step at a time. Um, I'm actually a little bit um, out of the loop with what exactly I owe to the IRS, and all it's going to take is me to go there and just sit down with them. I found a really nice person there <laughs> that has, she's tattooed and she talks to me, and so I, it's being on top of it. It's really, really easy to just kind of push it away and not worry about it, but you really have to keep on top of it. And I had, um, in the beginning, when we had nothing and Barry was in the nursing home, my really good friend um, helped me get an apartment. And now I'm fine on my own. And, and, but without her help, I just wonder what would have happened you know, where I'd be here today. That got me going, and I'm saving, and I'm just really trying to pay people when I can. But I did pay all the people back that we owed. Um, so that was tough. So thank you. I was going to ask a question more specifically about, you, you talked about going to check cashers and not being able to get a bank account, but now you have one. Could you talk a little bit about like the process you had to go through to like get out of that check cashing process and actually able be able to get a bank account at a at a bank? Yeah, it was really the I, I still go into my bank and I feel all this anxiety and I just stare at the wall kind of like I meditate so because I'm so afraid she's gonna say, sorry, you don't have any money anymore. Um, I finally got my guts up. I went to a whole bunch of banks. And I kind of feel funny saying this in this crowd, but I did research banks with very few branches. Um, I don't know why I thought that might be a good idea, but I think it was. Um, I'd go in, and the minute she asked me for my, he or she would ask me for my social security number, I'd say, oops, I got to go. I was so afraid. But then I, I got my, you know, I got brave, and I did go to a particular bank, and she asked for my social, and she asked me if I had had bank's account closed. And I said no, because it was my husband's name. And I got the account. Um, and I haven't been to the check cashing place probably in three years, four years, maybe even more. So it, it was slow, and it was scary. It was, I just, I thought that, I mean, my imagination, I'm a children's book author, so my imagination's like gigantic, and I thought, <laughs> They're going to arrest me right here. <laughs> the first time I was at the IRS, I was like, they know I'm going to be thrown in jail. And once you start learning to get over those fears, and, um, and, I, and again, I think it was the bank, the particular bank I chose at that time was a very small, small bank. And still with them. Um, this is another financial question because we're in a room full of financial nerds right now. Um, so as you were like navigating this very complex healthcare system and knowing the correlations between financial struggles and healthcare struggles, was there ever any support offered or suggested to you to deal with your finances like through that healthcare process? No, you had to seek it all out yourself. Yep. Okay. Yep. I do have to say that, you know, when we... Barry was tested for the neurological testing. Um, another blessing and beautiful people, they didn't charge us because they knew FTD. 
and they knew that this is a very typical story. It was really fabulous, and uh, but yeah, no guidance. Mm -mm. No. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs>
I'm with Dakota County, and <laughs> <laughs> we work really hard to provide excellent customer service and person-centered uh, work to help people who are experiencing transitions. And uh, in Dakota County, we have a financial empowerment department, and I'm the program developer there. And so what we'll do is when folks come in, for example, to apply for their medical assistance, we'll do a screening to see if there's some of those financial stressors going on as well, and then we can connect them right away to help them with things like maybe mm -hmm. payday lending traps and, and things like that. So I'm here today to kind of just maybe put in a little plug for some uh, what we can do to help uh, and how you can direct folks to any county really for what kind of help is available there great thank you so much John do you mind introducing yourself sure Thanks. I'm John Comer and I'm here today with the Financial Planning Association Financial Planning Association is a national organization that is about 28,000 members locally we have a little over 800 and the way that we support the groups in this area Annually, we have a financial planning day where we invite 200 consumers to come in and talk to a financial planner one-on-one. -on -one. A lot of the organizations in this room have been there to, as a resource partner to let these 200 people know that they exist and the services they provide. Welcome all of you to ask about participating in that, and there's a limited number of resource partners we can have. <laughs> we also we also have a uh, pro bono service that anyone can uh, ask for, and we offer that to people who have low income or in a crisis. The, the program started nationally at 9-11 when so many people didn't know what to do, trying to find a way to help them through that process. Um, what else do we do? We also do a lot of work in, in high schools with financial education and financial capability, going into high schools, going into uh, elementary schools to help students move on, do other programming and educational seminars like that around the Twin Cities. Great, thanks, John. And Lorraine. Hi, uh, my name is Lorraine Kanatarud. I'm the Director of Aging Transformation at the Minnesota Department of Human Services. Don't ask me to go into exactly what that means, <laughs> transformation. Uh, we try and make systems better for uh, and get, getting ready for the age wave, which um, as was mentioned, we have our, started already uh, adding many more seniors every day to our uh, population and it's going to get more and more challenging. So uh, that's the kind of thing that I do at uh, the department and I'm also head of our initiative called Own Your Future. This was a federal state effort that started uh, a few years ago uh, and I think the originator is in the, uh, in the hall today because John Cutler, who is one of our consultants, um, helped develop this Own Your Future. And what it was, it was an urging by the federal government and state government um, to make people recognize that they, start, they have to start planning for their long-term care financial needs. Um, and so that's the, the message that we really have within the Own Your Future. Um, it includes public awareness, writing consumers' guides and doing seminars and being available uh, for that sort of thing. We've also started working on product development because one of the financial issues in long-term care is that it is so desperately expensive uh, to get some of the products that we now have, whether it's long-term care insurance or life insurance or other, other kinds of products. So we felt that rather than just telling people to plan and to do something, we needed to start looking to see if we could find more affordable products that would be available to middle income people in Minnesota so that they could put aside money or buy an insurance product or something like that so that they could have more responsibility. We could bring that private money into the system and um, uh, decrease the dependence that people have on the Medicaid program. And that, you know, is one of the things that m states are very concerned about because um, of long-term care being expensive, very few people saving or having products that, is that are going to cover those expenses, and they fall into Medicaid quite quickly um, when, uh, when they start needing that. 
So we've been working on two particular products, and I don't know if you want us to get into everything right now. If I'm on a roll, I might as well keep going. Just keep uh, rolling. We uh, had a subgroup of our advisory co committee that took a look at a lot of different ways that you can use private financing to pay for long-term care. Um, and we came up with 15 different proposals. Uh, and out of that, we found two that we felt had a lot of potential. Again, we wanted things where the money would be private rather than um, asking for additional entitlement programs in Medicaid or Medicare. Um, and what we came up with is uh, the two that, that really uh, met all the criteria. One was a life insurance product, a term life insurance product that uh, you would buy when you're working and younger and you need that breadwinner protection for your family. Uh, and that product would convert into a long-term care insurance product when you retired. Um, and so it would be a long, really your whole life, protecting you in that stage of your life from the, uh, the amount of money that you might have to pay. <coughs> Uh, there is, this is not available in the market now. Um, we've done all kinds of due diligence. We've done actuarial work and consumer focus groups and all. And we're, we continue to be encouraged at the, um, the interest and at the affordability of this product. So we're continuing to work to bring that to the carriers and other and insurance companies to see if uh, new products can be developed. The second product uh, is for people who are on Medicare and who are already in their senior years and continue to need um, additional help paying for home care and, and financing. Um, this would uh, be a mandated benefit, an embedded um, uh, benefit within all supplemental plans sold in Minnesota so that there would be an enhanced home care uh, part of your of your uh, package that you would get uh, through this program. All supplemental plans would have it. And we were also very encouraged by the uh, relatively affordable uh, premium that, that came with the actuarial analysis on this. And also the seniors in the focus groups felt this was uh, a really of value. So we're continuing to pursue that and also uh, putting together other ideas for other ways that we can help people with the private side of financing so that they can be more affordable to the middle income. Uh, so that's what I do <coughs> on the Own Your Future. And I just need to say I'm wearing another hat for the uh, first, uh, the senior linkage line. Great. Um, they get 200,000 or more calls every year from seniors and from families, and many of those relate to Medicare and other financial issues. So we're a partner in all the good work that are, that's being done by other groups. Great, thank you so much. So um, just to start off the panel, um, I have a question that I was supposed to ask you, but I actually wanna ask the question that was asked by the group of Nancy, which is, um, so we'll, we'll go to the back end first and then work our way up. Um, in the event that there is a financial cat cat catastrophe like Nancy suffered, um, where do you start? Where do you even start to try to address that um, in terms of what paperwork do you, where do you start um, when bad things happen? I'm gonna look at you, Amanda, first, so. So, and my answer is going to be, it depends. <laughs> so, so, and, I, and, I, um, and I think in, in in, in Nancy's case, there, there was, um, from what we were told and from where I work, which is where we're looking at sort of perpetrators or somebody uh, really taking advantage or a fraud of someone, um, there we look at, uh, you know, how do we stop, stop the bleeding, which is okay. st still a, a appropriate for someone in, you know, in Nancy's situation, how do we stop? And, and her sort of l limiting the access for uh, her husband to the funds. That's something that we would also you know, recommend. How do we make sure that in our case when we have an older adult, um, if they are the ones reaching us for help, how do we support them um, from either revoking a power of attorney if they have the uh, ability to and capacity to revoke a power of attorney? If they don't, how do we work within the system to make sure that they are supported in, in getting that power of attorney revoked? So so really stopping that, that immediate um, 
fleecing of the funds, seeing where the damage has been done. And then for us, it's also encouraging if there's a perpetrator and there's a crime, um, how do we hold that perpetrator accountable? Right. So who can we go to? Who is the right you know, authority, whether it's uh, a county attorney office for prosecution, law enforcement, sure. or uh, you know, your office to, to do some investigation? And sort of that depends. If it's a Jamaican lottery scam, you know, the odds of something being um, prosecuted is, is, is nothing. I mean, it's not, it's very, it's very minimal. I don't want to be, I mean, there are some, there are some really, <laughs> right. um, it, it's hard to sort of get that money Who's back. won the Jamaican lottery? <laughs> <laughs> you didn't win it. So, <laughs> so, then, so, um, so for us, it's really, how do we stop and then, okay. and, and then support start. the victim and then move forward. And again, for us, it's all about what does that victim want? Sure. We That's are going really to be helpful. looking at what do they want to have happen? So Susan, people come to you when they actually are in this position and want some financial empowerment. What do you suggest? Right. Well, the first question we ask everyone is, do you have adequate health insurance? Mm -hmm. All right, so we want that to be the anchor. We have enough problems going on with these transitions mm -hmm. and tragedies, uh, much less having insurance that doesn't cover everything, mm -hmm. or you know, you're looking at things in a new way, getting a new explanation of benefits every five minutes. And so we're going to start with that, and then move up the the hierarchy of basic needs, just making sure that all of those things are in place. And then we're, and then we're going to get to a financial inventory. Okay, great, thanks, John. Um, when we've been working a little bit on the financial exploitation work at the Capitol and also the hang up on fraud, um, some folks from your organization who are on the front lines of helping advise people have seen um, some creative, like, can I use that word? Creative ways of taking, of separating money from the people who actually earned it. Um, what are some stories that you can share with us and some um, ideas about how to both prevent it and also what to do in the event that it does happen? So we, as Financial Planning Association, we like to do planning. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the pieces, I tend not to focus so much on fraud as on things like Nancy's story where there was no fraud perpetrated. The person mishandled because of issues, health issues, they mishandled money. How do we get people to recognize those are issues as well? How do we get people to know when it's time to give up driving? How do we get people to have conversations with their family about how can I help you pay your bills? All of those kinds of things are things that, that I focus on when I'm, when I'm looking at these issues. And one of the things that Nancy said that I really liked was take him to the Courage Center to get his license revoked. Find somebody else to blame. Right. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. and, and I think financial planners can play that role sometimes. If you're working with a financial planner and you're, you're husband and wife and you're disagreeing on how money should be spent, we'll get a third party's opinion and just recognize that they may not always be on your side when you bring them in. Mm -hmm. or find out which side they're on before you bring them in. <laughs> <laughs> so trying to figure out a way to, to get other people involved so that it's not, the person who's, you come and you have the conversation and you say no and you win the argument, you gotta live with them tomorrow. So try and find other people who can help with that, with that process and take some of the blame off of you. Um, and if you're in the situation, I hear a lot of folks, especially the folks who are involved in long-term care um, insurance, talking about caregiver relief. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The folks who are taking care of those who are having issues need some time away. When, uh, when my dad started having trouble, my stepmom tried to take care of him a lot longer than she should have. And so when he finally went into a nursing home, she ended up there for a couple of weeks to rest and to recover. So trying to find some ways to get some relief as a caregiver as well. Um, also have had a, a client whose daughter, getting back to the blaming somebody else, whose daughter thought that she was having issues and she did get her declared incompetent. And then they turned to the mother and said, and who would you like to manage your affairs? Well, not her. <laughs> Give me somebody I don't know a third party who has no knowledge of the family situation and no knowledge of me and let's get them in there to, to take care of this appropriately. 
that just doesn't seem like the right answer. And I think uh, that's because she had no documents in place. She had no conversations with her family. And so there was nothing in place to, to um, move on. So Amanda really wants to answer the exploitation question. She's like looking at me going, pick me, pick me. <laughs> so go ahead. I just, I, I, we talk and we hear a lot about the frauds and financial exploitations from the lotteries or the, the somebody trying to scam older adults and that happens. But two thirds of the time it's the perpetrator is someone that the older adult knows, loves, trust. It's the same as when, you know, when we talk about child abuse, it's less about that stranger in the van and who's sitting around your Thanksgiving table. So um, really it's family members, loved ones, trusted loved ones um, taking advantage of and financially exploiting that older adult. And there is a very high correlation in elder abuse. When you see financial exploitation, you almost always see, see, see some other form of abuse as well. So physical abuse, uh, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, neglect, there's, there are tools that um, perpetrators use to get at the access, the resources um, of older adults. So we can't talk about financial exploitation without at least talking about the care and well-being and other forms of abuse for older adults and that we should kind of look closer than other countries as well. We, gotta, we have to remember that. Good, thank you. And Lorraine, what, from Nancy's comments, um, what are sort of the, some of the highlights about financial capability that you take away um, in, in the context of the work that you do from what Nancy shared with us? Uh, well, that's a, a great question. Her story, I thought, was incredible to try and uh, take a look at all these different facets. Um, we, I guess one of the things that occurs to me is that this is, you know, in many cases, it's about a couple instead of an individual. Mm -hmm. And that that really changes everything because you're, you have to look at the financial uh, issues and, uh, you know, pros and cons in a different way. Um, you have to realize all the, the burden that they, that the other sp spouse has. Uh, and I don't think <clears throat> we're going to, uh, we're not doing enough yet. We finally realized in the 80s, being a gerontologist, you know, I went into gerontology in, a long time ago, and um, it was the 80s before we realized that family caregiving was a big issue. <laughs> before that, we had been thinking about services that people could get through the formal system. And then we realized that 92% of all the care that older people get is provided by family members. And they needed help, uh, financial help, they needed help uh, with support groups, they needed help, uh, as she indicated, uh, uh, getting into the system. Her, her comment about uh, what uh, Alzheimer's Association did for her in order to help her understand this system that she'd never had experience with before, but now needed that very badly in order to get the care that, and the help that she needed to take care of, of him. So I think, you know, there are a number of lessons that, uh, that come out of that, but we know that families are probably going to be even more involved in the future because we don't have the workforce of formal caregivers. That's one of the biggest issues, uh, certainly uh, in Minnesota, we have a huge issue, but many, uh, most states, uh, you know, are, are really, uh, str uh, really trying hard to find workers to go into uh, facilities and home care and that sort of thing. What that boils down to is that families are going to be on the line and, and right now we're increasing the number of family caregivers because they're in the boomer years uh, and so they're in their uh, mid-50s into the 70s, and they're taking care of their really old parents, <laughs> as well as we have the spousal situation that, that um, was described. Um, and so if, if we continue to see life expectancy increasing and we have more people who are over 100, 120, according to some futurists, you know, the family issue becomes a real public policy concern. I want to be a futurist. <laughs> um, Susan, maybe you could share with us, um, to sort of piggybacking on that, some of the resources that are available um, in Minnesota to families, particularly in Dakota County, um, that are available to families that they should maybe aren't aware of but should be. Well, first of all, I'm going to have to talk to you because if we're going to live to 120, <laughs> I have to change my plan. <laughs> So I will say about two years ago, after being embedded in community services and um, 
working on program development and really thinking I understand the way a county systems works, my mom at 87 had a stroke and I didn't know what to do. And so I think it's important to remember that when these kind of things happen, personal finance, mm -hmm. for one thing, becomes 10% about math mm -hmm. and 90% about your emotions and your family structure and how you all of a sudden this change has happened. And so it was really hard for me. I, I actually had to develop a, um, a group of people around me to, to help me understand the, the very system that I worked in. So um, what I wanna say is it is a little bit hard to navigate, but like Nancy said, that one foot in front of the other. And what, has to, what is to be offered at a county system throughout the state, and a lot of y'all probably already know this, but for those who don't, it's a lot more um, holistic than you might think because you're likely going to need someone from public assistance with the medical assistance, but then social services is, in, is involved in helping with things like, I, I believe Nancy mentioned a caddy mm -hmm. waiver and things like that. And we can get into a whole lot of um, titles and programs and everything. But hey, Susan, what's a caddy waiver? <laughs> I was just going to, I was just going to cover myself with that. Okay, good. <laughs> we can get into a whole lot of things about what is a caddy waiver and what's available, but everyone is so individual and eligible for so many different things. No, like literally, what does it mean? Oh, it, <laughs> Sorry. I mean, you can come into the county and, and get some help with your medical bills. What does it stand for? You are really killing me. I Sorry. Don't know. So who else knows? Does somebody know? Somebody <laughs> bail me out. Come, come on. on. Gets, All right. Uh, we'll Google it and we'll be back to you. Go ahead. How about a community assistance for disabled individuals? I think because uh, it's for uh, younger, younger development. yeah, developmental or physical disabilities. See, right. this is what you got to figure out how to navigate. Thank you. <laughs> team. It takes a team. That's what she was just saying. Okay, go ahead. Sorry, totally killing you right now, aren't I? I got to get my credibility. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> We're all friends here. We're all learning together. I didn't know what it was either. So what does that say? Well, so my takeaway is that regardless of income or assets, you have to ask. Okay. Because you, you might be surprised at what supports would be available to you through the county and the state and federal mm -hmm. programming. It, it might be that you can get help um, getting uh, bars or assistance put mm -hmm. into your home to help you age in place, okay? Mm -hmm. um, or it might be to help with your medical bills or transportation or things like that. So coming through the county through social services or public assistance and then I loved what Nancy said about the, she filled out three forms, even though I felt bad that she didn't get what she needed right away, she kept trying. Mm -hmm. And so asking until you have the answers and, um, is, is, really, is really important. As for what the county has to offer, it, it's holistic throughout a housing process, you know, or placement mm -hmm. or changing um, the environment that, at your home but just making the call first. So I just wanna follow up on something you said, and again, I'm sorry, but on something you said, which is that you had to put together, a com you had to build your own community. You, you need to build your own team. How did you do that? Well, I'm a pest, and so <laughs> you just start calling. Um, but what, what I think it needs to come, what your team needs to be is your financial support, someone that you can trust. At Dakota County, we have financial empowerment programs for uh, accredited financial counseling is available to anyone who comes through our door and community service regardless of why they're coming in. Um, if you don't have that, uh, the AFCPE or Association for Financial Counseling Planning Education does have a find an AFC on their website that you can look for. Um, social service agencies throughout the state, they're you're gonna be able to look it up on the web and, and just contact their adult services line to get to connected with professionals that know what to do next. And then you need to keep those people on your team because the team's going to change and what you need from the team is going to evolve, mm. right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you might start with, I just need help with the, with the railing, but then eventually you might need help with transitioning into the long-term care and things like that. So keep your team close and make sure you know that it, it'll probably need to change and be updated. Great, thank you. Um, John, I'm gonna sort of ask for some free advice. 
because um, you know you're a professional, you get paid to do this. But um, we're all here today. Oh no, advice too. <laughs> um, so again, you know, as we're thinking about the front end of this, right? How do we start to plan? Sort of what are some best practices, some takeaways that we all can take away from today for ourselves, but also as we start thinking about being caregivers and, and, and uh, the, thing, the people that we care about in our families. What, what are some tips that you can give us today? So, so more and more, I think a part of the role of a financial planner is to, well, the stated role is to help you get to your goals. And so let's map out what that looks like. Let's then the hard part becomes that behavioral finance part. Mm -hmm. What's in your way? A lot of what's in your way is what's between your ears. And some of it is outside forces acting on you. Um, so you, there was something I was going to say that you, based on your question, what was your question again? Well, you started with what our goals are. Do you help us right. identify what those are? Well, we help you identify what those are. We help you I wanted free advice. That's just, that's yeah. what I wanted. I wanted okay. you to tell me how to, to plan for my future financially. So, so it, identify, <laughs> identifying that, oh, the piece that I was wanted to mention is the other part is we, I think a part of our role is to help you figure out the awful things that could happen. Hmm. Not everybody needs nursing home care, but what happens, what would happen in your case if you needed it? Are you prepared for it? Not everybody needs memory care, but if you need it, are you prepared for it? And we can't always cover all of those issues. People have constraints on their finances, they have constraints on their health, they have constraints on their goals, they have constraints on their vision. So we can't always fix all of those problems, but at least we can raise them and make you aware of them and get you to start thinking about them earlier. The team that you mentioned is really important um, as you start needing some of these services, if you have a power of attorney, a basic accounting principle is to have two people involved. Mm -hmm. So you give power of attorney to somebody, find somebody else to watch them, to look at the statements and make sure that things that are going on are the right things that are going on. And do it well before you think there are any issues. One of the reasons I wanna start having conversations with people is I don't wanna, ask them if they're ready to give up their car the moment they need to give up their car. Mm -hmm. I want to start the conversation at 50 so that they don't have to worry about it for 30 years. And we know that we're planning ahead and, and it's more of an abstract thought at that point. What would happen then? How would you get around? How big of an issue would that be? Asking the, those questions at 50 and getting them to think about it and talk about it three or four times before they turn 80 and want to give up their car. Um, another piece that I think about a lot, I hear clients coming in and saying, I need to do these things now because when I'm 75, I won't be able to do any of these things. George Bush jumped out of an airplane at 90. <laughs> There's somebody in my church who's about 86 who regularly goes to Argentina where she was born at 86. People's lives evolve differently and that does not mean that at 65 you shouldn't do your wish list and get all these things done that you can do now and, and plan to jump out of an airplane at 90 and wait until then to do it. But you also shouldn't assume that at 75 or 80, you're not gonna be able to do anything anymore. That you, you may be able to do all the things that you're doing today. And it, it may not be a whole lot different for you. So prepare for that as well. Great, thank you. Um, Lurie, I think one of the challenges that we have sometimes when we talk about financial capability is does it sometimes assume that people have money with which to be capable? And I think that's one of the challenges that we have when we have different demographics, particularly as people, you know, economic backgrounds to begin with, let alone, um, but then also as we age and some of those, those things change. So what are some tools, some tricks, some things that you think about in terms of financial capability, regardless, sort of across the demographics of both economic um, ability as well as uh, age and, and uh, diversity? Good question. <laughs> um, I think, you know, it, you're absolutely right that we have a, a big uh, difference in where people are uh, as they age. Uh, in their later years as far as their economic situation. 
one of the things that we don't like to see is the fact that the lack of savings and the Great Recession and a number of things really hit this uh, leading edge of the boomers very hard. And so they were expecting to have things that they had put aside that just were gone. And so that's gonna follow them throughout the rest of their life. And the other thing we, we see is that um, there are f very few people who actually do a good job of saving. And uh, for both the long-term care needs and just general retirement in, um, you know, uh, for their expenses, um, we just do not have a good, uh, we don't do enough of what we need to do. Um, in response to looking at the lower income side of things, uh, in the aging network, we do have a lot of, of services that are um, either available uh, through the public systems like Medicaid, but we also have uh, programs through the Older Americans Act that offer uh, uh, affordable um, and, and uh, you know, suitable uh, for, uh, services for people who need home delivered meals or caregiver support or transportation. Um, and so we do have uh, in the system some things that are more affordable because it's a contribution only. It's not a, a, a fee scale that you have to uh, pay. Um, and because of that, uh, when you're looking at your long-term care uh, 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 needs, I tell the seminars that I speak at about housing and other kinds of things that they should be looking at the community that they're mm -hmm. in to find out if the community has affordable services. And if they have things like a living at home block nurse or um, you know, the Red Cross provides transportation using volunteer drivers, that tends to be, those kinds of things tend to be more affordable. And if you have them in that community, you probably want to stay in that community uh, because uh, if you have fewer dollars, uh, they're going to go farther because you have those kinds of uh, community programs available. Okay, thanks. So start thinking of your questions because I'm going to open it up in one second. Um, but I, before I do that, I just want to kind of go across the panel and say sort of what is the number one lesson learned you have in this space and financial capability space that you can share with the group? Um, John talked a little bit about it and for us, um, I'm always looking towards prevention because when we work with victims, that's really intervening and the abuse is already happening. So how can we stop the abuse, neglect, financial exploitation before it starts. And when we're talking about the financial exploitation world, the conversations are really important that we have with our own families, especially because um, we know that many of the perpetrators are, are p potential perpetrators. They don't happen because somebody says, I am a bad guy and I'm gonna take all of my grandmother's money. It has to do with other external factors and frankly, entitlement that we see a lot of, that uh, pr the, there's some research being done at the EU that we're partnering on that really kind of shows a link between the family financial exploitation and the entitlement. It's going to be mine soon anyway. Mm -hmm. This idea of planning, and we don't want somebody else to get it, especially the nursing home. I don't want my money to go to the nursing home. But the reality is we do not currently have a society or uh, you know uh, federal entitlements that that support everybody in free you know, care in a facility. That, it's expensive. And um, if we live longer and need kind of formalized care, we have to figure out a way, if we have assets, to not have them diverted, either stolen or diverted so that it doesn't go to pay for that. Conversations, we can prevent a lot of this by um, having conversations with all of your kids or the people that you want to make decisions for you when you no longer can make your own decisions um, and doing that beforehand. Don't do it, you know, the, when you, you never think you're gonna need it. So we always have to be thinking about who do I want to, um, who do I trust to make those decisions and how do I pick a couple people? So there's checks and balances in place and because I know that they'll support um, what I want and being willing to look outside of the traditional um, kind of rules of who we think should make those decisions for us. I had a gentleman talk to me after I spoke one place and he said, you know, I'm thinking about who I need to make, be my, have assigned my power of attorney to. I know, I feel like it should be my oldest son. Like that's just what I feel like it should be. That's what's done. He'll get mad if it's not him, but he has a gambling addiction and two bankruptcies and he just lost his house. What do you think? I'm like, well, you know, I can't tell you what to do, but what do you think? <laughs> you know, you're coming to me with this question. Like, we don't have to pick 
our oldest son and we have, or daughter or whoever, we have to pick somebody that we trust will make the decisions for us. And then we have to have those conversations so that everybody knows and they're hard, but that is the best way to sort of prevent us from being in a position of where someone is within our own circle is attempting to take advantage of us. That was maybe longer than you wanted. So. <laughs> Helpful, great. Well, I like what you said about the man that thought it should be his oldest son. And I think that when we get into people and mm -hmm. cultures and mm -hmm. expectations, it's a very strong mm -hmm. force. Um, you will have a lot of folks that say, I can't place my parent in mm -hmm. a nursing home. Mm -hmm. I have to take care of my own mother which can then prevent you from being a wage earner and taking care of your children or educating your college age kids. And so you're, you're sometimes going against a lifetime of what you believe and what your community supports to make these financial decisions. And I think that's why sometimes we hear from people when they're already in a lot of trouble. And so I like the idea of an open conversation about this, all of us, uh, modeling how to do it. Mm -hmm. Uh, talking to our kids about money, finding things that bring us joy that don't cost money. In the end, what you have to do that brings you joy doesn't have to cost you money. Um, but so yeah, a lot of just keeping the conversation open and then to just encouraging people to know what financial exploitation or financial instability might look like. A lot of times it, it, it can look like a mental health issue. Mm -hmm. Mom's not washing her clothes anymore and she doesn't turn the lights on and she doesn't you know, do a lot of things that she used to do. Uh, it can be that there's money problems and she can't afford the laundry soap or to turn up, turn up the heat. Mm -hmm. So just keeping your eyes open. Nancy said that it was a gradual thing and mm -hmm. looking back, she noticed, mm -hmm. right? Because we're in something every day, we don't notice the change. Um, we get a lot of calls in, in January because folks have gotten together with their mm -hmm. older adult loved ones and mom, dad's changed, you know. So just keeping your eye open and keeping the conversation open. And what's your best practice, best takeaway? Trying to get people to have some of these conversations is, is one of the things that I, I think works best. And it's hard. Um, in addition to behavioral um, behavioral finance that helps us to understand people's issues, there's a financial therapy association now <laughs> that studies people and their issues with money. Money is a little more complicated. It's not just a tool that we're using to pay the bills. There are emotional attachments to it. There are secrecies attached to it. If we could talk to the people we trust about the issues we're having and um, our expectations for them. If we create an estate plan and could actually tell people, this is why I did it differently for you than your brother or sister, because I've noticed these things about you. You have that gambling problem and I'd rather not give you a million dollars so that you spend it all tomorrow afternoon. Um, or I'm not giving you anything because your sister really needs it and you don't. And so walking through some of those pieces and not assigning so much um, baggage to the, um, to the money issues that you have and trying to have some of those conversations. Ray, what's your takeaway? Well, what strikes me as I'm listening to us talk is going back to the, the family thing the, and, and what uh, Nancy talked about, the overwhelming um, impact of all of these pieces on the family. And as I think, you know, um, as this future has said, if we have an aging society where the family is going to be asked to do even more, how will that change families? I mean, and what do we, who are developing the systems and trying to figure out what they need help with, how can we be sensitive to this, um, the kind of changes in the kinds of help that they're going to need in the future? Thanks. Okay, who's got a question for this esteemed panel who knows everything? <laughs> Hi, thank you guys for being here. Um, I, I had a question for Lorraine. 
Um, I first of all thank you for the existence of Senior Linkage Line. I think it's amazing, and I've always been able to get really great answers every time I call with a participant. Um, second of all, I'm wondering. Um, so, for those who don't have the privilege, who are always in crisis mode, privilege to think about these prevention conversations. What are you doing to build that into the fabric of communities? And also, specifically for Lorray, you talked about these products you're building for middle-income people, um, but what about low-income people, and how do we serve them better in dealing with these crises um, and addressing these needs for long-term care, insurance and products like that? Okay, well, <laughs> a, a lot of different ways that I could go on that. But first, uh, the question you asked about focusing on middle income and then what about low income. We're focusing on middle income, and we define that as people with 50000 to 125000 in uh, their annual income. So it could be a person, uh, one individual household or, or two uh, wage earners. And the reason we did that is that we were looking at products that people would need to purchase you know, like a new version of long-term care insurance, this uh, life stage product I described. Um, and so people will, you know, middle income, uh, as it's defined by our, you know, our, our assumptions, means that they would be able to afford a premium of between 20 and $50 a month or whatever. Um, that's true for the Medicare uh, home care program that we, uh, the benefit that we're talking there, that the premium uh, would be less than $20 added to their current premium. So we felt the middle income was an important place to look because they can actually, if there are middle income products, they can take it up and they can use that to pay for their long-term care. People who are below that 50,000, who we would consider low income, are going to be very quickly eligible for the current programs that we have, Medicaid. Um, and that's why we have one of the best Medicaid programs in the country, because we know that we need a good uh, safety net. Um, and we, we do have a, a very progressive one here in Minnesota. The other side of things, people who have more than 125 going up, they can self-fund for the long-term care portion of their retirement. And so we're not uh, talking about uh, you know, developing products for them because they, they can self-fund. They may not even need to buy a product. So that's the way that we've thought about the work that we're doing on these products. Uh, it doesn't mean that we're not going to be looking at Medicaid to see how it can incent people to um, you know, use private funds for long-term care, but we, we feel that the safety net is there that can uh, help them pay for the long-term care that they need. Another question? Yeah. One piece, if I could, if oh, I could yeah, add, just sure. you talked about the people are already in crisis. Obviously, we want to get people before they're in crisis so that they don't hit crisis, ideally, or they're more prepared for it if they do. But I think that Nancy did a great job of talking about what happens if you're in crisis. You just keep taking steps forward and you make an incremental adjustment and you, and you keep working toward it and you um, hope that you take enough steps quick enough so that you, you can get back on track before everything is gone or before your health dissipates or whatever. Um, but when you're in crisis, there are lots of people who are willing to help or are able to help you get through some of those issues, whether it's a tax issue or a budgeting issue or a credit debt issue or whatever. There are resources to help in those cases. But it, it is still, you still do have to, you are responsible for taking those steps and to just walk through it. Question? Yeah. Hi, um, this is my first time in a panel like this, so I do appreciate you guys taking your time and really helping us realize finance, not just about money, but it's an entire community life throughout. But my question may be uh, too technical. It might be a more of an actual question. But you talked earlier about term insurance that would transition should be permanent in the older age. My understanding is that when it's term, it's a lot more affordable 
so what happened when you reach the time where you are technically no more earning an income, but yet you open a permanent plan that is likely to be more expensive? How do you guys deal with that transition? I think what I hear you saying is that you've planned. I think it's. it's I think it's. Oh, it's the way. Oh, it, 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 I think it's the insurance. Oh. The insurance, right? Yeah. How do? How do oh, okay. Does do, is it? Does it stay a flat rate when you quit? Re, when you retire, how do you then pay for this plan, which then your needs are higher? Are your? Yeah. Is, does it become more expensive? Is that what? Yes. Um, well, we are uh, looking at things that have an even uh, or a level premium. So that, say for example, in this life insurance, the term life insurance, where you would buy that when you're younger, and say that uh, you're a, a 40 year old w woman at that point, and so your premium is going to be $40 a month, because that's, I think, about what it would be. You have the term life insurance, the protection for your family, as term life insurance provides, and then you retire at age 65, and that turns into a long-term care insurance policy. The premium you pay for that part of your um, policy is the same as what you paid at the beginning. And the reason that they're doing that by uh, maybe increasing the premium a little more at the beginning so that it, be, it is level throughout, but more and more of the money is going to prepare for paying for your long-term care. Uh, I mean, that's the way the, the insurance company would, uh, would look at it, I think. Um, so an, uh, a level premium uh, is, is what uh, we're assuming. Now, somebody is probably thinking, well, they can raise the premiums, and that's true. Uh, but our assumptions are that it would uh, continue to be level. And that would be uh, uh, also true right now for the Medicare home care. Um, you know, that that's level each year, uh, and then if you go to another plan, you might have a higher premium, but that's your decision because you want different kinds of benefits or different kinds of services. Did that answer your question? <laughs> okay, okay. Maybe you guys can talk after, too, yeah. if that's okay. Any other questions for the panel? That awkward silence. I have a question for the audience. Oh, <laughs> turnabout is fair play. Right? By all means. So it's always, I think, interesting when we hear these things and we're, we're thinking about how are we going to help people and what are we going to do different in our job and who am I going to talk to after and are there any donuts left? <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's important to just take a moment and be mindful of ourselves and um, projecting, you know, like what you said about. Where, where is my next step, and does that fit into how I want my life to be when I imagine myself at 65 or 70? And so imagining your best day when you're at that age and trying to build around that, um, I just think it's an important thing to, to think about because, heck, who, who thinks about that every day? No way. John. Oh. This guy. <laughs> <laughs> Only John. <laughs> so, I mean, to, to that point, just because we have a couple minutes, just so we know. So, how many people in the audience um, are caregivers? Okay. Oh, mm -hmm. How many people in the audience are being cared for? Every day, right? Um, how many people in the audience have as their primary professional responsibility to uh, think about financial capability? <laughs> How many who are not, it's not their responsibility uh, professionally, still think about financial capability at least once a week? <laughs> right? That's good, right? Okay, you guys are special. Special? Or, yeah, thanks. That's why you're here. Um, but it's really helpful for us to think about um, that we, we bring something, we, the community in this room, really bring something to the table and to every conversation that you have that not everybody um, has and not everybody brings to the table. And so it's a real opportunity for us to share what we know and to share what we learn at things. I mean, the fact that we come to things like this um, shows that we care about these things and then that's incumbent upon us to then go and share it with the rest of our community. We, we want, I want to thank you, too, for being able to share with our community when we go out and meet with seniors. Um, Jen, I don't know where you are, but... She's eating donuts. <laughs> <laughs> She's getting my last donut. <laughs> but, uh, 
No, to be able to go out, and we work with the sheriff's department, too, mm -hmm. and so it's really neat because we can get out there right in the community with the seniors where they live and talk to them about different um, scams and frauds mm -hmm. that are out there and help protect them, and then all of a sudden they have that friend, the friend in the sheriff's department that they can call, and they, mm -hmm. you know, making those partnerships, too, and the Department of Commerce has been a, a great, great partner in that work, and thank you very much for great. that. Thank you very much. I want to give the panelists one last shot at saying everything that they didn't get to say yet. So I just wanted to say one thing about long-term care insurance policies, and it's not this, I don't want to burst a balloon, or I think they're great options. I would encourage us all, you, as we're looking at them, or as we're you know, suggesting these are, as products are, are or clients should buy to think about. There are sometimes, I know Commerce has been involved, we do run into problems. I have had clients, victims who, you know, um, it, it, it can be a waiting game with an insurance company. So they will deny, mm -hmm. deny, deny. Call, call Commerce if that's a problem. And the person, yes, yeah, so that's, uh, and, and then the person dies and the insurance, the long-term care insurance policy that you've paid into for all these years is worthless. And so that's not always the case, I know that, but call commerce if that happens and just it's something to be aware of if you're selling this product or if you're suggesting this product to really look at the specific product that you're either purchasing or yeah. and really look at the details of, of when that will trigger and how easy they are to work with so that's uh, there's my doomsday <laughs> Thanks. No, no. Uh, that's, I'm full of good news. But that's, so. I mean, that's true with any with any insurance product, right? Obviously, the Department of Commerce, um, those of you who don't know, we regulate insurance. Mm -hmm. We also regulate energy. We also regulate uh, financial institutions, securities, uh, unclaimed property, missingmoney.com. Mm -hmm. If you leave, uh, write that down. My husband is on that. I need to. <laughs> so we actually returned like $84 million to Minnesotans last year through the Department of Commerce for missingmoney.com. So just saying, um, we're rates and measures. Um, but on the insurance product piece, we take that very seriously in our role. We actually are both uh, compliance, we also do civil enforcement as well as criminal enforcement on insurance fraud. So please, uh, we don't want you to get to crisis, but if you're, you've got a difficult issue with an insurance uh, company or insurance product, please call the Department of Commerce as quickly as possible. Did you have a takeaway that you would like to leave us with? Anybody else on the panel? I just want to also say thank you to the Department of Commerce for all the emphasis on things related to seniors. Mm -hmm. They've been great partners. You've been great partners with Own Your Future. So thanks for this because it raises these issues up and I think that's really important. Great. Thank you so much. So my takeaways for the day um, are that we need to have early conversations about hard financial issues, that we need to have our eyes open about gradual changes that we need to plan for change, but also plan for no change, plan for continuing to have the life and the lifestyle that we want to have. That it's about 10% math and 90% emotion, and that we all need to put one foot in front of the other. So I really wanna thank the panel. I really wanna thank Nancy again. I wanna thank all of you for coming today. Um, let's give the panel a round of applause. I encourage you to stick around for a little while. There are some folks out in the hallway that you may have not gotten an opportunity to talk to yet who are showcasing their financial capability work um, and an opportunity to network with each other and make connections and eat the last donut. Um, and I really thank you all very much for being here and we look forward to seeing you again next year. So thank you.